So, you've just noclipped into the back rooms, and you're wondering where you are. To put it simply, you've just entered level 1, the first frontier of the back rooms covered in endless yellow wallpaper, with lights giving off the famous humbuzz. Welcome to your new home. Level 1 scores a 1 on difficulty, 0 on entity count, and 1 on the chaos gradient, giving it a score of .667 on the Bastet Fraser Index. When looking around, level 1 resembles an empty office, with the walls being covered in the iconic yellow wallpaper, and when looking up, you may notice an oily red liquid dripping from the ceiling, causing the floors to be uncomfortably moist. However, no matter how delicious it may look, do not drink this liquid, as it can cause bodily mutations and loss of sanity. When traversing the infinite level 1, you will notice it's made of rectangular rooms with seemingly random sizes. Some rooms are impossibly wide, tall, or too narrow to even fit through, and bigger than what should be possible. On top of this, some sections of level 1 are very damaged, with chunks of the wall on the floor, usually from a pickaxe although claw marks have been seen. The support beams are usually torn and broken with signs of stretching, and the wallpaper can appear to droop because of the water damage, or can be completely torn off outright. If you ever get tired of the mono yellow floor you're on, well, great news! There are an infinite number of other mono yellow floors to choose from, each separated by about 20 meters. These other floors can be accessed by climbing massive cylinder shafts with steel plated walls, usually found every few hundred rooms behind thick steel doors. These doors can be pried open with a crowbar or other similar tool. Once inside these shafts, you'll feel a constant warm, damp breeze, and notice the vents lining the shaft, puffing out carpet fluff, with an unknown liquid leaking out. Sets of blue lights also line the shaft, giving it a faint blue glow. How comforting. When attempting to reach other floors for whatever reason, for example escaping an entity, remember what floor you're on since every floor looks exactly the same. You can use ropes or other similar tools to climb down the shaft, but be careful when doing so, as falling down the shaft may be an even worse fate, and it's also a pretty stupid way to go. When descending, you may also find precursor checkpoint terminals in the middle of massive steel platforms. Moving back to the yellow insanity, fluorescent lights are commonly found in level 1, with a constant loud humbuzz coming from them. These lights can also be found broken, with shards of glass on the carpet with the wires and light bulbs still hanging. The humbuzz that comes from these lights can cause mental effects, such as hearing things that aren't there, and extreme confusion. If you ever begin to feel these effects, hiding in the previously mentioned shafts will stop the symptoms, as the humbuzz cannot be heard when inside. An important thing to note is that inside level 1, objects don't appear very often, which can lead to dehydration and starvation, so it's very important to pack supplies when going into it. However, in your case, you've just no clipped in, so best of luck to you. Dead bodies also disappear from where they died, and it's unknown where they go. However, despite all of this terror and gruesomeness, many colonies claim level 1 as their home, starting off with the UNCB or the United Nations and Colonies of the Backrooms Outpost Cockney, with a population of around 100 people, which is a collection of doored off rooms to prevent accidental entry. The BRU, or Backrooms Researchers United Outpost Batichri, was originally a research base, which was created when the wall of level 1 were found to have unusual features. After the experiments finished, it became a residential outpost, now having over 150 residents. The JRC, or Jade Razor Clan, Outpost Takashiri, was only created because any member of the UNCB had to have an outpost, so it was created. It has a small population and is rarely used, but there was always one important member of the outpost, never more, never less.
Random camps make up the rest of the colonies, which are hard to find and are spread out across level 1, usually abandoned from years of neglect, with a faded logo on them. The other active camps are run by people who live on level 1, although they are private property and are better left ignored. If for any reason you want to get to level 1, you need to noclip from baseline reality. Other than that, you can enter through level 1 sublevels. However, this is by no means an invitation to try it, this is just for educational purposes. And if you would like to leave, the only exits go to level 2 by finding a special staircase, or by going into one of level 1's sublevels. Congratulations, you've made it past level 1 and you're now trapped inside level 2. Sadly, it doesn't get any easier from here. Level 2 scores a 2 on difficulty, 3 on entity count, and 0 on chaos, averaging a score of 1.6 on the Bassett Fraser Index. When looking around, level 2 is a bunch of infinitely long hallways made of dirty stone brick walls and concrete floors. These hallways are connected by even shorter hallways with no ceilings, and walls that can stretch up forever. Some of the walls in level 2 can appear cracked or broken, be made of cinder blocks, have caulk in them, and similarly to level 1, can have an oily red liquid leaking out. Known as carpet fluid, it's acidic and will burn you if it touches your skin, as well as causing nausea and vomiting when drank. Remember, do not drink this liquid, it is not delicious. Moving on, level 2's floors can rarely be carpeted with a similar carpet used in level 1, and large amounts of stone dust cover most things in the level, which if disturbed will fill the air and cause breathing <laughs> problems for anyone in the area. On top of this, many parts of level 2 are filled with radioactive radon and are cut off with yellow caution tape. When looking up, you will notice beams with fluorescent lights hanging from them, which have been compared to a night sky filled with stars, known as the Cogwell Matrix and commonly seen in a lot of levels. On top of this, catwalks are also found and can be used as a fast way to move around the level. That is, if you can even get to them, as they are not connected to the ground. If you somehow manage to get on the catwalks, you should be careful, as they have much more entities on them when compared to walking on the floor of level 2. There also might be hidden riches inside the level, as it was found that the hallways curve over long distances, which means the level is a circle and has a center. This center has been rumored to have a massive amount of supplies that never runs out. However, no one has ever seen it, although the BRU and BEA are currently trying to find it by using the catwalks. Speaking of groups, a few big ones reside on level 2, starting off with the CGS, or Cult of the Golden Sword, Outpost Colby, a group of around 50 treasure hunting citizens on a quest for riches, made because of the rule that any UNCB group has to have an outpost. A much more threatening group on level 2 is the Liberated in Outpost Acura, a big political group of over 200 members that holds the high-ranking officials of the Liberated, with the base being heavily guarded. Assorted camps make up the rest, being scattered around the level, although a massive abandoned camp exists, being blocked by a huge cloud of radioactive radon. To enter level 2, you can take a special staircase from level 1, marked with the words basement or below ground floor. Doors with a down arrow on them in level 1 can also lead to level 2, and any of level 2's sublevels can lead back to it. If you'd like to continue forward, you need to find hatches that go even further down into level 3. Besides that, level 2's sublevels are the only other exit. Welcome to the infinite underground tunnels of level 3. Let's see if you survive and dive right in. Level 3 scores a 3 on difficulty, 2 on entity count, and 1 on chaos, averaging to 2 on the Bassett Fraser Index. Level 3 is an infinite collection of service tunnels located about 20 miles underground, with the halls being narrow and cut right out of the rock using tunnel boring machines. These machines connect to drills and processing facilities, moving power, coolant, and occasionally molten magma. The level goes up forever, but only so far downwards, although the machines are constantly making the level deeper as time goes on. Vacuum sealed doors can also be found, and always in rows of two. However, it's advised to not open two doors at the same time, as it can cause a huge amount of wind, with the area between two doors being filled with a deadly fungus. 
Level 3 is also filled with pipes moving various liquids, although it's usually an anomalous coolant that keeps the tunnels at safe temperatures, as without it, the tunnels would be boiling hot. It's also advised not to touch the pipes for pretty obvious reasons. On top of this, it's advised not to touch the rock, as it's under extreme pressure, and if disturbed, could send boiling hot fragments flying at fast speeds in all directions. On top of this, the temperature difference between the walls and pipes can create dangerous weather, such as dust storms strong enough to throw people around. It's also highly advised to pick up supplies from earlier levels, since none can be found here. Due to the dangers of this level, no communities are set up, so best of luck. If you'd like to enter, you need to go down hatches found in level 2, and any of level 3 sub-levels lead back to it. To continue forward, going through a service door with the drill shafts will lead to level 4. The only other exits are level 3 sub-levels. Alright, level 4. Oof, this one's a doozy. Level 4 scores a 5 on difficulty, a 1 on entity count, and 5 on chaos, averaging the 3.6 on the Bassett Fraser Index. Level 4 is a series of maintenance corridors made of concrete, with ceilings lined with fluorescent lights. These corridors are filled with highly dangerous electric and fire hazards, such as large pools of water that are electrified, and exposed wires without insulation. Offices can also be found throughout level 4 that contain highly valuable food and electronics. However, these offices are found rarely and are usually traps. Overall, exploring this level is not advised and can lead to death. However, I would advise that you subscribe to be well informed. Level 4's purpose is as the source of all power to the back rooms, and is extremely important to the back room's existence, with the level defending itself at all costs in a variety of different ways, such as exploding transformers, electrical arcing, and lights failing at critical moments. The level is filled with wiring that gives power to the entire back rooms through entangled batteries, with the power grid being organized like a typical power grid, and receiving power power from electrical stations, although this is where it gets unusual. These electrical stations get their power from bigger and bigger stations, like a fractal that just keeps growing forever. Super stations get their power from mega stations, and so on and so forth forever. It's also theorized that by taking out a large enough station, you can make entire levels lose power. No communities are able to exist in level 4 due to its dangers. Best of luck, you will certainly need it. You can enter through service doors in level 3, or by taking an elevator in level 13. Level 4 sublevels also lead back to it. To continue forward, you have to stay inside one of level 4's offices for around 24 hours, after which you will be taken to level 5. The only other exits are level 4 sublevels. Level 5. Let's dive right in. Level 5 scores a 1 on difficulty, 0 on entity count, and 3 on chaos, averaging to 1.3 on the Bassett Fraser Index. Level 5 is an infinite empty office in a constant thunderstorm. All the lights are off, with the only light coming from the windows present in every room, which should be impossible, and is one of the many unusual features of level 5. Other examples are hallways that cross without intersecting, and rooms that share the same space. On top of this, rooms are commonly flooded, however unusually can't flood other rooms, and level 5 changes seasons every 10 years, and is expected to change seasons in 7 years. The outside of level 5 is an infinite void only containing the constant thunderstorm, and both the clouds and rain of the thunderstorm are made of almond water, which makes almond water very easy to obtain inside level 5 by simply opening up a window. The storm itself is the main danger of level 5, as it can become violent and destroy entire rooms. Opening a door to one of these rooms will reveal a torn off section of the building and expose the inside to the violent storm, so don't do that. It's also worth noting that destroyed rooms do regenerate, however it takes several days to complete. Level 5 is devoid of entities, which makes it easy to explore, and typical office supplies, decorations, and machines can also be found, making it a good source of supplies. 
Obviously, due to the safety of level 5, many colonies reside on it, starting with the UNCB outpost Hartkirch, which serves as a resting point for wanderers before entering the gauntlet that is levels 6 through 9, and has a population of around 200 people, since some wanderers just choose to stay on level 5. The Liberated are back again in Outpost Monorush, which was established to expand the group's reach since level 5 is a common resting point, and since establishment, the Liberated have seen a massive increase in new citizens. Assorted camps make up the rest and are easy to find and also often abandoned. To enter level 5, you can stay in level 4's offices for 24 hours, or by going through level 5's sublevels. To exit, you can go through a fancy hotel door to enter level 6, or through level 5's sublevels. Level 6, the Oriental Hotel. Let's take a look, shall we? Level 6 scores a 4 on difficulty, 0 on entity count, and 1 on chaos, averaging to 1.667 on the Bassett Fraser Index. Level 6 is a finite hotel in the Oriental style, and no matter what, you will always enter level 6 alone, even if you enter with a group. Meals will appear in the dining area in the morning, noon, and evening, along with beds remaking themselves, and music playing in the ballroom, which when listened to for long periods of time will cause memory loss. Level 6 also has strange effects on objects, with modern technology being impossible to use, and drinking almond water will cause hallucinations and temporary paranoia, so it's recommended to get through level 6 without objects. However, despite having no entities, a tall cephalopod-like being is seen in paintings, vases, stained glass, etc. And when not looked at, these objects will change to show the beast closer to your location. If the beast is depicted in the same room you're in, you'll have a strong feeling of being watched and a powerful urge to run away. The beast is commonly depicted around the boiler room, guarding the exit to the level. On top of this, level 6 drives wanderers insane through isolation and pure terror, and has detrimental effects on sanity. Level 6 is broken up into four different areas, starting with the lobby, which contains mostly empty hotel rooms with mild decoration and furniture, with strange objects from the 1920s through 40s in the closets. The beast is not common here, and two elevator doors can be found, however, the doors are melted together, making them unusable. The diner is a large room near the entrance that contains 12 tables, a salad bar, and a dessert table that changes food three times a day, as stated previously. The ballroom is a large room at the end of the hallway that has two dozen headless mannequins that give an eerie sense of being watched. 1940s ballroom music is always playing that causes mental deterioration and permanent memory loss if listened to for a long time. And finally, the boiler room is an infinite area outside the hotel filled with pipes, vents, and boilers, obviously. It's mostly cramped passages with low-hanging pipes with the floor being iron grating, and the only light coming from the fire in the boilers. Water leaks from the ceiling causes steam to rise that can cause injury, so staying in the boiler room for long times is not recommended. Since you can only find yourself in level 6, colonies are impossible to form. To enter, you can go through fancy hotel doors in level 5 or one of level 6's sublevels. To exit, you can go through shadows in the boiler room that lead to level 7, with the only other exits being level 6's sublevels. Level 7, the only level where blind people have the same chances as you. Let's begin. Level 7 scores a 4 on difficulty and entity count, as well as 3 on chaos, averaging to 3.667 on the Bassett Fraser Index. Level 7 is an infinite maze in complete darkness, filled with railingless catwalks, pipes, and infinitely tall cooling towers. The temperature is around negative 7 degrees Celsius, so warm clothing is advised. Inside level 7, there is no such thing as light, and any light source brought into level 7 will stop working. The main dangers to watch out for are falling off the catwalks and falling to your death, freezing from the cold, being attacked by entities, and being confronted by bandits. These groups of bandits roam level 7, climbing along the pipes as they have memorized the level's layout, with some even using echolocation to move around. 
Now, time for a science lesson. It's believed that the energy that would have became photons become neutrinos in level 7, with the pipes getting waste heat from levels all across the back rooms that are put into massive cooling towers, and instead of giving off thermal radiation in the form of infrared light, they give off neutrinos instead. Working together with level 3, level 7 completes the back room's energy cycle, with level 7 serving as the heat sink. The high amount of neutrinos let level 7 absorb huge amounts of heat without overheating, and on top of this, these neutrinos can very rarely impact normal matter and cause bright flashes in Wanderer's eyes. Level 7 is not a safe place, and the UNCB recommends to move quickly, and if possible, avoid the level entirely. This is why. By staying inside level 7 for long periods of time, huge physical changes such as loss of pigmentation, sharpened teeth, longer and looser limbs, and loss of eyes, and mental changes such as loss of logical thinking, stronger instincts, and losing the ability to speak, now being referred to as pipe dwellers. Pipe dwellers are pack entities that eat dead corpses and even each other if desperate enough. They actively hunt humans by using their sharpened teeth to tear flesh off the body. They can be killed in the same way as a normal human can, but if you kill one, more will likely follow. No communities can be found here due to the dangers and effects. You can enter level 7 through shadows in the boiler room of level 6, or any of level 7's sublevels. On the contrary, you can exit through the center of a cooling tower to end up in the water of level 8, or by going through an open pipe you'll end up in one of the buildings in level 8. The only other exits are level 7's sublevels. Level 8, the flooded city. Let's literally dive right in. Level 8 scores a 3 on difficulty, 4 on entity count, and 0 on chaos, averaging to 2.334 on the Bassett Fraser Index. Level 8 is an underwater Soviet town from the 1960s, with buildings made of pure concrete with no windows, and in the brutalist style. Inside these buildings, it's possible to live on the upper floors, since floors 3 and above are completely dry, although floor 2 is flooded to about knee depth, and floor 1 is completely flooded, with these buildings rarely having exits to level 9, forcing wanderers to swim through many buildings to try and find an exit. The water is salt water and is the bottom of an ocean, with various fish and other deep sea life. Hydrothermal vents can also be found that provide heat and light, although should be avoided as they release irritating chemicals and are extremely hot. On top of this, the ocean is infinitely deep with no surface that never changes pressure, and above 30 feet from the seafloor, the pressure becomes stable, making buoyancy stop working and going more than 30 feet up from the seafloor impossible. A dangerous hive species known as the Skule roam level 8, laying still with only their jaws above the ocean floor until their prey swims above them, which will cause the Skule to circle the prey and strip its flesh in mere seconds. These Skule are divided into three categories, one with a spade-like lower jaw made for stripping flesh from the bone, one with a traditional mouth made for tearing chunks of flesh, and one with a mouth similar to a sawtooth shark, made for grinding flesh into bits. When the flesh of a prey is turned to paste, they take it underground and it's unknown why they do this, although it's speculated they are taking it to their queen. Remember, keep an eye out and avoid all patches of seafloor with odd toothy protrusions at all costs, but do keep an eye out to make sure that you're subscribed. Assorted camps can be found in every building and are usually friendly, although never be too sure. You can enter level 8 through the pipes or cooling towers of level 7, or any of level 8's sublevels. To leave, you need to find holes in the buildings that lead to level 9. It's also worth noting that some of these holes let water constantly flood level 9. The only other exits are level 8's sublevels. Level 9, The Cramped Caves. Let's crawl right in. 
Level 9 scores a 4 on difficulty, 2 on entity count, and 4 on chaos, averaging to 3.334 on the Basset Fraser Index. Level 9 is an expansive, solutional cave system, constantly flooding with water from the exits of level 8. If an entrance to level 9 is flooded, it will move further up in the cave system where it is no longer flooded, and the water rises at different rates depending on the shape and pressure of the cave, ranging from feet per second to meters per hour. Each cave is extremely narrow, averaging 1 meter by half a meter, and can be even narrower, with some caves being impossible to fit through. Vertical passages are an uncommon blessing that can save wanderers' lives by escaping through them and providing essential breathing room. Certain sections of level 9 are made of different rock types, and most commonly, quartz formations with crystals made of backroom substances, such as almond water, carpet fluid, and fire salt. Very rarely, you may come across entrances to stone corridors. These entrances are between 3 by 1.5 meters to as small as 6.5 by 5 inches. However, while it is easier to explore these stone corridors, they are inconsistent and change often, and as of currently, anyone who has ever entered them has never returned. A unique species of poisonous brown spider, known as itsies, can be found making strong webs inside the caves. These spiders are around 1 centimeter in size, are very hard to see, and eat worms and other small prey, with their egg sacs holding hundreds of newborn spiders. Their spider bite is not lethal in small doses, but will cause what wanderers describe as a spinning sensation and a loss of direction, which could lead to death. Although, around 30 bites is enough to kill a healthy person, so remember to avoid webs and egg sacs at all costs. These spiders are also known for making bubbles of air that help them flow and breathe when they are submerged underwater, although they prefer to stay on land. Here is a summarization from Compilation and Analysis of Water in its Many Forms by Dr. Sol Almagro, page 78. The page describes the water flooding level 9 from level 8 as almost drinkable, being filled with nutrients and being filtered by the almond water, quartz, and fire salt crystals, of which the fire salt crystals add flavor to the water. The only reason the water is not drinkable is because of the carpet fluid crystals, which lead to the water causing metal poisoning and other digestive problems when drank, with the amount of carpet fluid in the water increasing for the past decade. They believe that carpet fluid is an invasive substance never meant to be in level 9, and that the pipes that connect level 8 to level 9 were made to bring safe drinking water to the whole of the back rooms before it was infected by the carpet fluid crystals. And here is another summarization from Myths and Legends, Cautionary Tales, Lost Knowledge, and the Disparate by Max Huxley, pages 11 through 15. The pages describe the story of the refinery station, which tells the tale of three brave wanderers who came to explore level 9, with the first three days of their trip being normal to most expeditions. However, on the fourth day, they found a huge open cavern dozens of meters in width and height, with a concrete rectangle in the center, with steel legs and pipes going into the rock. After searching, they found a watertight entry into the rectangle and found thundering machines taking water from the deeper parts of level 9 and moving it upwards. In the center, they found a bunch of tubes, turbines, and tanks that let out an asphyxiant gas and leaked a deep red liquid, most likely carpet fluid. Later in the story, while messing around with the machines, causes the gas to be ignited and the cave to collapse, with the three explorers barely making it out alive. With the current knowledge, the gas is most likely hydrogen, and the machine was purifying water and separating hydrogen from oxygen, with the invasion of carpet fluid poisoning this process. The only other places where both hydrogen and carpet fluid exist are the Cogwell matrices and the Eye of God, where it was likely sourced from other still-working refineries. This leads to the prediction that carpet fluid in these machines comes before their destruction, with the destroyed level 12 making the point pretty clear. Due to the constantly rising water, colonies are impossible to form on level 9. 
To enter, you can go through holes in the buildings of level 8, through holes or cracks in the ground inside level 21, or any of level 9's sublevels. You can exit by digging through patches of earth found in the ceilings of some of the caves that lead to level 10. Level 10, the Almond Fields. Let's stop and smell the almonds. Level 10 scores a 2 on difficulty and entity count, as well as 1 on chaos, averaging to 1.667 on the Bassett Fraser Index. Level 10 is an expanse of loamy earth filled with golden shafts of almond grain, with large twisted oak trees coming from the ground, and a hazy mist covering the azure sky. A series of large metal silos filled with almond grain can be found along with rusted farmhouses. However, it's advised to avoid these places as they are protected by hostile entities found nearby. Because of this, not much is known about the structures. The field grows almond grain, a plant exclusive to the back rooms used for making fresh almond water. This process is detailed on ceramic tablets by ancient civilizations, such as the Legion. The process starts with almond grain being ground up and then mixed for a few minutes in large vats of fresh water in order to become fresh almond water. Many merchants became rich due to the profitable almond water trade, with the process being done by cheap slave labor, as gallons of almond water could be traded for raw materials. However, this industry is also dangerous, as the almond grains follow a strict growth cycle, blooming in the summer and seeding in the fall. During the spring season, the grain lets out a hallucinogenic pollen that causes wanderers to wander aimlessly before collapsing in the fields, with the dead eventually decomposing into the ground. Now, if you do come across a body with a thin layer of pollen lining the flesh, don't be alarmed, as many of these so-called corpses are actually living people in a comatose state. If they are taken away from the fields and treated, they can be cured, however will have permanent mental changes, such as increased hostility, aversion to light, and a strange urge to quote, maintain the back rooms, and subscribe to the channel. Huh, weird. Of course, a few colonies reside in level 10, starting with the Harvest, which is a group of reanimated humanoids wearing a scarecrow outfit, and they control large areas of level 10. They are organized and intelligent, and harvest almond grain to be placed in massive silos, being immune to the hallucinogenic effects of the almond grain, with a social hierarchy and a farmer underclass existing, with the underclass burying themselves at night while the rest hide in farmhouses. The harvest are hostile and can't be reasoned with, and will even hunt wanderers with sickles, scythes, and other agricultural equipment in order to use them as fertilizer so it's best to avoid them at all costs. Mrovha Kazudia is a unitary state of the UNCB, and was formed when the leaders of the Mrovhite made a deal with the Kazudian people. The colony's houses around 120 people, and contains residential structures and cultivated farmland. The economy is made almost entirely from the almond water trade, with materials from level 9 and wood from the twisted oak trees being used for construction. In the past, the Morovhite monarchy clashed with nomadic communities, forming a lasting tension. It's advised to be careful when entering Morova Kazudia, as they are suspicious to newcomers. Several nomadic communities make up the rest that rob nearby silos and harvest almond grain in the fall, and often fight with the harvest over resources. These communities vary in hostility, so it's advised to keep your distance. You can enter level 10 by digging through patches of earth in level 9, and you can exit level 10 by entering isolated doors that will take you to one of the houses in level 11. Level 11, the neighborhood of darkness. Let's begin. Level 11 scores a 3 on difficulty and entity count, as well as 2 on chaos, averaging to 2.6 on the Bassett Fraser Index. Level 11 is a very large suburban neighborhood, composed of 1 to 2 story houses. There is no weather, and the level is constantly dark and always at midnight, with the only light source being the rows of street lamps with death moths hovering around them. The level is typically quiet, with the sounds of crickets and occasional pitter-patter from the carpet fluid, dripping from a large megastructure, lighting up the sky with fluorescent lights, known as the Cogwell 
cogwell matrix. Black metallic pipes run across the cogwell matrix and are filled with carpet fluid, occasionally bursting open and raining on the houses below. These houses of level 11 also have many strange features, such as the inside being larger than the outside, grass yards as floor instead of wooden floorboards, and chandeliers that defy gravity by hanging upwards from the floor, with other strange anomalies in level 11 being stairways that lead to nowhere, and entire houses floating in the sky. When you enter level 11, you will most likely be placed near the center of the level, which contains few entities and wealthy gated communities. However, the quality degrades as you go further from the center, becoming slums that contain small amounts of food in the cabinets, but not enough to survive off of, as well as having massive amounts of entities. It's worth noting that the center has no food, and inside level 11, you get hungrier faster. On top of this, the only exits are far away from the center, so you can't stay for long in the center or even the slums. After passing the slums, you'll reach the industrial sector, which contains large factories that tower over the landscape, constantly spewing hazy gas that pollutes the air, creating massive gray clouds that make the Cogwell Matrix impossible to see. This section will rain down carpet fluid, turned acidic by the sulfuric smoke, so try and cover any exposed skin. The industrial sector is inhabited by a race known as the Elites that will offer you a position at their factories, offering rations as payment. The conditions are subpar, but it's the only way to sustain yourself. These factories produce unusual objects, with the intention of mass production being unknown. Past the industrial sector is a large expanse of rocky terrain with no structures or life. It stretches for 60,000 miles before being cut off by a massive wall of houses, making further travel impossible. The single colony residing on level 11 is the previously mentioned Bavarian elites, a group of shadow-like entities inhabiting what they call New Bavaria, operating the facilities and factories that make up the industrial sector, with little information on their operations known, although an ulterior motive is speculated. If you accept their offer and work in their factories for a week, they'll give you chemicals that they claim prevent depression and increase productivity, and after taking them, you'll no longer feel emotion and only have an urge to work. Observations have shown that after a month of taking the chemical, you'll have become almost machine-like, working without sleep until you die of exhaustion, only existing to serve the elites. At this point, you are no longer considered human, instead being instances of Entity 12. You can enter level 11 through isolated doors with a metal frame found in level 10. To exit, you can find large frames of metal skyscrapers in between the massive wall and the industrial sector that have a metal door. Entering them will lead to level 12. Level 12, a giant middle finger to end the quantum stable levels. Level 12 scores a 5 on every category and will fuck you up faster than you can say, I hate the old wiki. So you better pay attention. Level 12 is the ruins of an infinite city that was destroyed by the supernova from the Eye of God, completely obliterating the ozone layer in the process. The landscape is composed of rubble, crumbling remains of walls, and twisted rebar poking up from the ground. The sunlight is blinding and lethal, forcing travelers during the day to stay in the shade, with skyscrapers destroyed completely or reduced to their ground floor by debris, and concrete basements can be inhabited for some well-needed shelter. Although these underground structures are still unsafe, so it's advised to stay cautious, as various entities have been known to hide inside basements and cellars, so search the area before setting up camp. A way of clearing entity nests is by lighting fire salt charges. During the night, entities will roam freely around the debris littered surface of level 12, making it even more dangerous. On top of this, portal shatter from the fractured Eye of God's beam portal brings a constant stream of entities from various levels into level 12. If you see floating embers gathering, leave the area immediately, as it's a sign a new portal will form and dump more entities into 
into the level. Inside level 12, you have three options, traveling by day, traveling by night, or preferably dying. Traveling by day lets you avoid entities, but being scorched by the sun is a big threat. Also remember to find shelter before around noon, when the sun is highest. Traveling by night lets you avoid the sun, but risk being killed by entities. It's advised to always be armed, mobile, and ready to flee at any moment. Level 12 also has numerous areas that should be avoided at all costs, such as lakes of molten metal that radiate extreme heat and reflect the deadly sunlight during the day, as well as pieces of the Eye of God that are infested with entities, especially the main lens fragment that contains the beam portal that connects to any level, however the entity count is far too high to deal with, even by massive heavily armed groups. Surprisingly, colonies still live here, starting with the UNCB Research Headquarters, which is a mine shaft under the original base before level 12 went kaput, populated by scientists, soldiers, administrators, and other staff who are responsible for managing all scientific UNCB projects and the most important experiments, with rumors ranging from unethical entity-human hybrids to particle accelerators. The BEA Outpost Boja is an outpost used for storing and selling goods, both legal and illegal, and operating on the bottom floors of a ruined skyscraper with UV blocking tents set up around it. Several JRC mercenaries under contract defend the base from entities, and is most commonly known as the center of the flat gas incident of 06. Post Supernova Mining Organization Bunker, or PSM01, is located deep underground, dedicated to extracting steel from the Dyson Sphere remnants, being a dangerous yet profitable endeavor. You can enter level 12 through doors in ruined skyscrapers on the outskirts of level 11, and you can leave by entering the remains of an apartment building that will lead to level 13.